Welcome, everyone. I'd like to call tonight's regular council meeting to order. Motion to suspend the regular council meeting and enter into the committee of the whole meeting. Moved by Councillor Nish, second by Councillor Murrow. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Okay, call tonight's Committee of the Whole meeting to order. Recommendation at the agenda for the Committee of the Whole meeting of March 25th, 2019 be adopted as circulated. Moved by Councillor Eighty, second by Councillor Randhawa. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, first up we have a uh, presentation from our Chief Financial Officer regarding the 2019 budget. Thank you. That's better. <laughs> so this community of the whole includes the second public engagement opportunity prior to the final budget recommendation after we, rec we receive the final assessment values from BC Assessment. At the first public consultation held on March 11th here in Council Chambers, we presented a snapshot of the February 25th preliminary budget presentation. Staff identified a preliminary budget surplus with no initial changes to services using the assessment values provided by BC Assessment in January. The proposed use of surplus is as follows. A return of two RCMP members to the force and a return of one bylaw officer, both of which have been operating with restrictions since the days when the pulp mill closed setting up a reserve to offset the expected loan repayments on the future RCMP detachment and reduce the mill rate by 2%. As the screen identifies, the proposed residential rate is lower than the mill rate in 2018. This is a result of a combination of recalculating the mill rate to adjust for the small increase in assessed values and the proposed reduction. Given that many property owners' assessments either increased, decreased, or stayed the same, it is important for owners to calculate the impact to them on an individual basis and compare the result to last year's municipal bill. The presentation outlining how an owner can calculate the impact these rates will have on them can be found on the city's website. Property owners are reminded that the property tax notice they receive includes taxes we collect on other agencies' behalves. These funds are remitted to these to those agencies and make up approximately 30% of the tax notice. The municipal mill rates shown on the previous slide are only in respect of the city's budget. Staff would like to remind home and business owners that property taxes can be paid in advance on a monthly basis through a pre-authorized withdrawal program. Paying monthly can smooth out the financial impact of property taxes. Those with mortgages can have their property tax payments combined through their lending institution. Anyone interested in setting up a pre-authorized withdrawal program are encouraged to contact City Hall. Staff released the proposed five-year financial plan budget document on March 1st. It is available on the City's website as well as in paper copy at City Hall, the library, and at the Recreation Complex. For residents who aren't present at tonight's meeting, you have a new on uh, we have a new online engagement platform called Rupert Talks. You can register at engage.princerupert.ca to participate and find the city's proposed five-year financial plan document just mentioned on the previous slide, frequently asked questions, a video explaining taxation, and other resources. The anonymous survey will close at 4 p.m. on March 29th, and results will be aggregated and shared with Council as part of the budget process. Paper copies of the survey will be available at City Hall, the Recreation Complex, and the Library. Comments and questions can also be received through email at finance at princerupert.ca. Final BC assessment values will be provided next week, at which point we will incorporate the information and provide it to Council when we seek direction on April 8th. Thank you for listening. So at this time, uh, members of the public are 
welcome to come forward and speak to uh, anything they wish on the budget this year. So if you have any comments on this year's budget, please come forward and uh, let us know. Welcome back. Yeah, my name is Terry Saka. Um, I have a number of questions that I would have, like to ask um, with respect to the budget. Um, how many new positions have been created in City Hall in the last four years? I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. At this moment, I would be venturing a guess, but it's under seven, I believe. Oh, at City Hall. I thought you meant City, sorry. No, City Hall. At uh, City in, Hall? In, in this premises. Um, I think there's just three. So understand that uh, city council has given itself a wage increase. Uh, well, there's no wage increase. It's a committee recommendation that's not been passed. So if you have some comments you want to make about it, you can feel free to do that. Well, I'm only reflecting on what I've read. We've we've been out of town for a while, so I'm only reflecting on what I've read in a local newspaper, and uh, um, it's my understanding that the federal government has removed a perk where a third of council and mayor's wages were tax exempt. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And, and now they're no longer tax exempt. And that's Canada wide. Correct. So the recommendation from this committee, um, according to Mr. Thompson, um, in a paper again, I saw him just rely on information that was made public that money buys better democracy. I don't understand that rationale in my little world, but um, I'm not aware of that. But I think a $6,000 jump and a $12,000 mayor jump uh, seems a little bit excessive. So my question out of this is what what do those numbers reflect in um, percentage-wise to the budget? Uh, I don't have the percentage on me right now, but I can definitely look into that. I can tell you that the the recommendation that was provided by the Blue Ribbon Committee was uh, completely covered within the budget and uh, with the new tax revenues that we saw come into the city. So there was no ta tax impact to anybody. We didn't have to raise taxes. In fact, we actually proposed a reduction. Well, I realize you didn't have to raise taxes, but I remember um, uh, two or three years ago that there was a $60,000 shortfall and the recommendation from the uh, chief financial officer at that time was to raise taxes by 1.5% which didn't go anywhere. So I would think that roughly a $50,000 increase would have some percentage increase on, on the overall um, would reflect on the overall tax because the, the, the two percent that we're uh, we're getting um, a reduction on in, in my case is going to make fifty eight dollars difference on my property tax, which is really nothing. If you're asking what the percentage uh, change would be for uh, a, a percentage increase for the mill rate of the amount of the increase that has been provided by the Blue Ribbon Committee. The amount of money that was uh, recommended by the Blue Ribbon Committee amounted to, I believe, $45,000 extra overall. Uh, and $45,000 extra is approximately about 0.4% uh, of an increase, if it wasn't there. So that that increase hasn't been um, hasn't been incorporated in the current budget. 
that increase has been incorporated into the current budget that has not been passed. It's been a, it's a part of the budget process. But yes. it hasn't been passed? No, not yet. Okay. That, that, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, next speaker for the budget, please. Anyone else would like to come speak about the budget? if you could say your name for oh. the corporate administrator as well. Uh, my name is Joe Lewis. Um, uh, regards to the, the, the budget, I guess, with the, the tax decrease, um, I think uh, in this day and age where everything with the amount of inflation um, and aging infrastructure that the city has faced, um, taking on the um, the pulp mill and uh, its liabilities, I guess, for the, the cleanup. And there's there's like things like the Koya Dam, um, the Rainbow Lake Dam at Boneyard Creek, which is uh, compromised and being undermining. Um, uh, I think with all of these sort of things that the city's faced with, I, I don't think it's appropriate to sort of decrease the, the, the taxes and uh, another thing I would like to ask in regards to the budget is I do some volunteer work with the fish hatchery and stuff and there's uh, a number of things there that are going on like the they have old aluminum tanks and stuff like that everything is uh, it, it kind of needs an upgrade like I uh, Matthew did an article on it, icing up and stuff in the winter, and that is, it's a very serious problem. You get a lot of smolts and stuff that die out throughout the winter. The uh, trail system throughout there has been degraded and uh, down through McClymont Park. Um, I have a Facebook page, the Hayes Creek Habitat Restoration page, and there's a lot of uh, pictures and stuff on that page of uh, examples of the, the de degradation of habitat over the years. And when they rerouted the creek to um, to build, I believe it was the, the the civic center or the pool area. I can't remember exactly what year it was, but that's when they put in the the, the rock walls and stuff that kind of flow through McClymont. That sort of a uh, habitat is really um, unnatural. There's no natural floodplain and stuff. So that the the creek needs a. a, a a restoration badly, like a habitat restoration, and I've talked with the Department of Fishery, Fisheries and Oceans and stuff like that, and I would like to ask the city maybe to put it into the budget for consideration to uh, put some money aside or into the creek. Um, there's a lot of things that could be done, um, repairing and planting and stuff, just trees along Creekside to provide shade. And, uh, there's a, a committee formed through the, the fish hatchery of, of individuals that are involved that are kind of uh, coming together. So that would be one thing I'd like to ask maybe is some funds for the, the hatchery because I believe that that trail system is, is a vital part of the community and it, it's a representation of, of life in the community really. Um, in the past few years there's been little to no salmon returning in it. Um, I've seen one pink salmon in 2017, and since then there has been zero pink salmon. They were historically in that creek. There's, uh, for coho returns, they, uh, the hatchery alone stocks around 10,000 smolts a year or more into Oldfield and Haynes Creek. And for uh, creek assessment and creek count, like we're not, we're not seeing, you know, not even one percent of those fish returns. Uh, the habitat is you know, severely degraded, like I mentioned. And there's a lot of things that we could do to repair it and upgrade it. But um, uh, another point I'd like to point out is uh, habitat restoration. 
uh, NOAA, uh, an organization in the United States that manages all that stuff, has proven that for every $1 put into habitat restoration, it regains about $6 uh, through recreational and economic, like social activities or whatever, uh, whether it be directly or indirectly, it does create jobs and stuff for people to, to repair it. And it, and it kind of showcases part of the community, like it, you know, having a salmon bearing stream flowing through our city, I think is uh, having a vital, healthy, you know, habitat and ecosystem, I think is, is really important. Oh, that would be all I have to say, I guess. No, Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, gentlemen. Anyone else that would like to speak about the budget? I missed one question. Is there any companies or businesses that are using the Watson Island business model that I call that, where where they're defaulting the taxes and they're just paying the the, um, the penalty? Not sure. Uh, not, not to my knowledge, but um, I do understand that Port Alice is now going through somewhat of the same situation where their mill has, uh, all their staff have been sent home. Um, they went through a restructuring a while ago, or a curtailment rather, and uh, and they've been told that they're going home with no paychecks, and uh, there's taxes owed to their community that make up 70% of their budget, and they're owed. So it's it's possible that they're going to be running into the same situation as us, where we end uh, where we ended up with the the pulp mill at tax sale. So that's the only other one that I'm aware of at the moment. There's there's no businesses in Prince Rupert that are in default of their property taxes. Just like any other, uh, after three years, uh, any any business or or um, personal property, if there is no taxes paid, then it is sold at tax sale here in this in this room uh, once a year. It's the last Monday of every September. Yeah, and we all know what happened with 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 the pulp mill, where that three years was carried over and rolled over and rolled over and rolled over. Uh, there was different uh, different buyers that were involved, different owners at the time. So uh, previous to the most recent um, tax sale, uh, the previous one I don't believe ever went to tax sale. I think that there was uh, some sort of provincial intervention. Okay. Um, does the city of Prince Rupert receive any money from the casino? Yes, we do. And what, what's that amount? approximately $400,000 a year and it is allocated out to community groups. Is, is there a record of how much of this money is allocated to community groups? Yeah, it makes up part of our community enhancement uh, grants which are uh, decided on every single year by council. So is that available? Absolutely. Okay, can I get a coffee? You can come and see us tomorrow during business hours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that has any comments? Welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Hi. My name is Kate Toy. Um, I just have a quick question, and I would like um, clarity before I proceed. Is that if um, it looks like there? I'm just reading on here that uh, planning and design. It's planning and design of the city is something that. Uh, I understand there's grants being applied for. Is this something that would be looking at match funds out of the budget for the city? Um, at the moment, we're just applying for grants. So okay. I'm not sure if we're matching any money through the city or not. But Can are you talking I about redesign, Rupert? Rupert? I, and, right. and, and, and planning downtown core yeah, and that yeah, kind of... Those are yeah, grant applications for So now. that isn't relevant to the budget? Uh, the, the city uh, does have some money from Legacy is allocated into the budget for re uh, redesign Rupert. What's going on? Sorry. Is anyone here buzzing? Yes. Or is it just me? Okay. <laughs> um, so so that, uh, that is a part also of a, a matching with the rural dividend that we did receive right. um, over last year. So it's an 18-month program. So we're into the last six months of that part. Yes. So is it relevant if I speak to that? 
Great. Is it relevant if I speak to planning? If, yeah. if you'd like yeah, to, yeah, sure. Okay. Great. Um, I emailed everybody, and um, Councillor Addy has replied to my email. And I, this is not a judgment, or uh, this only comes out of um, this only comes from good. That it's very apparent that our council is all male. And I would uh, love to see a woman's voice included in the designing of uh, downtown core. I sent an email to everybody from upstream. I hope you've uh, had a chance to look at it. And it was a phenomenal survey that was taken that if there was a, um, a curfew put on men, how a city would look different for women. And so I think that it would be great to just have that kind of a lens come into planning. I don't even think that's a budget matter I think it's related to the budget but I don't think it would add a come at a cost to the city to have that lens brought up that's all that I wanted to share okay thank you I had, didn't get that email so I'm have to double check on that one thank you anybody else that'd like to speak to the budget okay then I think we'll move on to our first presentation uh, which is Colleen Fitzpatrick and Des Nobles from the Prince Rupert Environmental Society regarding rail concerns. Welcome. Good evening, and uh, thank you to Mayor and Council for providing this opportunity to bring an issue to you that we believe is of significance and is a a relevant issue we believe to both this community and to the Northwest in general and that issue is rail safety. On January 26th of this year uh, <coughs> author Bruce Campbell came to town on a book tour. His book was Lac Megantic, Rail Disaster, Public Betrayal, Justice Denied. It was a very interesting evening and we had hoped to see the city there or some members from City's Council. Unfortunately I guess due to constraints you were unable to attend. Not to worry, I've brought you all a copy of Bruce's presentation and I would urge you all, please, to take a look at this. And the reason is, is that we have an unregulated or very lowly regulated rail system in this country. It's essentially been run by the railroads, been deregulated. We have trains running with 200 cars with one individual operating these vehicles. It's becoming a bit much. We had another derailment not too long ago in the Kicking Horse Pass, and the Minister Garneau came up with the idea of finally making it mandatory to use the handbrakes on these trains. That being said, the industry is pushing back very hard to push that back off the rails so they don't have to do that. We in this area, I think, have uh, some serious issues to consider. We have some very large projects scheduled for the area here, all of them bringing in hazardous materials. We're looking at conceivably up as high as 400 more rail cars a day coming into Rupert and through the communities in the Northwest. These cars will be comprised of primarily hydrocarbons, gasoline, methanol. We're looking at diesel and possibly Bunker C. This creates a problem for our communities. When we were running grain and lumber through our communities, a very different situation. You derail a lumber train, it's a bit of a mess. You clean it up, you deal with it. We now have trains coming through our communities that pose very significant risks to our communities and to the people that live in them. I would urge you all to like I say, get a hold of this book, to give it a read. It is quite a tale. And as Bruce put it, this is a cautionary tale, one that we would be well do to observe and possibly deal with. Um, we have an ask of the city, and that ask is that after you have reviewed Bruce's presentation and, if possible, read the book, we would like you to write a letter to Minister Garneau, Minister of Transport, and request of him an upgrading of rail safety in Western Canada and with a great and hard look at Northwestern BC. There are many other communities that are doing similar things across the province here with regards to this. And as well, there will be a resolution coming forward to the North Central Local Government Association requesting letters to go to Mark Garneau. I would hope that those of you that are attending the NCLGA this year will support that resolution. And I will leave it at that and hand it over to my colleague. Yeah, thanks, Deb. Uh, also, thank you to the Mayor and Council for allowing me to present on behalf <coughs> of the Prince Rupert Environmental Society. And we'd also like to thank the Mayor and the Chief Administrator's Officer who attended a meeting with the port some time ago, back in April, I believe it was. And the 
concerns that I'm going to address tonight are more about the health and safety of the residents of Prince Rupert. In saying that, I will speak to the issue of emissions, rail traffic, and, a and the impacts of that. These issues are having an impact all over this town. And unless you live in that area, I, I don't know how many are aware of that, but we've heard complaints from the Kootenai area as far over as Dodge Cove and all along the waterfront. And we're worried about a major incident happening. Um, many Im individuals, including myself, have attempted to resolve these issues. And we have not been successful. We've, uh, there's been a continual finger pointing between CM, the port, and the Prince Rupert uh, Port Authority. And I, I'm not saying that in a negative way. We're, we were trying to find a way to meet the needs of our community. So um, I do live on the waterfront. I want people to be aware of that so I know what I'm talking about. And I do believe many of these concerns can be corrected with very simple discussions. I think there's some simple solutions to a lot of them. But what we're having is that engines are sitting idling in front of residents all along the waterfront. The air brakes are continually being released in front of the residences. And the emissions are also being released. And as you can well imagine, with the increase in water traffic, the emissions are going to grow. So we're very concerned about that. And some of these emissions, people don't realize, are up to and including cancer causing. And the port does monitor it. And we're very afraid of something happening if there's a massive leak of these chemicals. The trains that travel along the waterfront are doing so at varying speeds. And when the cars are empty, there's a great deal of vibration. And um, the noise is rapidly increased. The faster an empty train travels, the, fa the more noise you hear. Um, and we're really concerned about a derailment, especially in the downtown core here. And I know everybody will say, oh, it'll never happen because it's all flat. Well, there's lots of ways it can happen. They're continually working on the tracks, so that could be a factor. Um, human error, we're all subject to that. So those are just concerns that we have. And the other thing is the extreme shunting. For anyone who's visited or been on the waterfront, at some times it sounds like there's been an explosion going off. And this is, I want to say it's not just happening between 9 and 5. It's happening around the clock. And when the um, aqua train is loading, which is a quite a long, I know they hear it all along uh, over on that area, um, it's only going to get worse because they want to put in Wolverine. And the question we have for the city is, do you have an update on Wolverine? Because we're really concerned about this project because it's mere meters. I don't. I hope some of you go down and look to see where they intend to put this because it's, it is literally mere meters from some of the homes. And um, it's going to be transferring fuels. It's going to be storage, storing fuels. But we haven't had an update on it. So we'd like to, to, ha to know if you have an update on the status of that project. And I also think it's important that people understand that CN does not divulge to the public what they are carrying on their cars. They keep that information for themselves. It's for their preparedness and response purposes. But what about the safety of us? What are we prepared for becomes the question. Because like Des says, they're carrying a lot of chemicals in those trains. Um, the lessons of Lac Megantic, and I too would encourage you all to read it, um, is that the safety of the residents, should there be a rail disaster on our waterfront, lies solely in the hands of our municipal council. And I think we've seen proof of that in some of the incidents that have happened, not just this one. So today I'm here to ask these things of the mayor and council. First of all, to write a letter to the Prince Rupert Port Authority asking for this following information. For the public to have access to the continuous air quality monitoring data for the Westview site, the Fairview site is already online, and by making it available on the BC air quality, air quality monitoring site. And in addition,
addition to that, because winter, of course, is a different picture than summer, we would like to be able to get the 2018-29 winter months data. Secondly, we are asking the mayor and the council to engage with the Prince Rupert Environmental Society to seek solutions for the rail complaints by entering into the process of resolution by following the gu guidelines as outlined under the Canadian Transport Agency. And each of you receives that, and one of the main things is that we start with City Hall to see if they will engage in that process, to begin the process of resolutions of these concerns. And finally, we are asking the city to develop an emergency response plan for the health and safety of the residents of Prince Rupert. This pl plan should include public input, and in addition to the plan, should include evacuation protocol. And with that, I end my, my preparation for you. Thank you. Are we able to get a copy of that for the corporate administrator? I, I have... Uh, the motions that I put before Perfect, you. Great. Can, who do I give that uh, to? to? Oh, okay. Antonio there. Yeah, absolutely. Questions from council? So yes, I did attend a, t a meeting in April to discuss some of these issues with the port with you guys. Um, happy to re-engage. Uh, we'll review the uh, materials that you submitted here and I think there's a lot of, like you said, simple solutions that we can work together on. So happy to work with you guys on that and uh, we should set up a meeting shortly and begin those discussions. Oh, perfect. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Kay Hulson, BC Emergency Health Services regarding community paramedicine. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Kai Hulson. Oh, Kai, my apologies. <laughs> and I'm uh, working uh, already 12 years uh, as paramedic here in town and I want to thank uh, mayor and council uh, that I have the opportunity to talk about some words about community paramedicine. Community paramedicine is a project from the Ministry of Health. It started out roughly four years ago here in the north in some test communities like Hazelton and now we see it all over BC, from Vancouver Island interior, up the coast and here in the north. This program looks, of course, different in Upland BC than in Tofino on Vancouver Island or here in Pr Prince Rupert. The essence of that program is it's um, administered and monitored for effectivity down, uh, in down south provincially, but uh, put in action, it's a community thing. It's um, very important what we do here, what needs we have here in our town, and the ambulance service or this position has the flexibility to react on that. Right now, um, over the pro whole province, we are 120 in serving in 100 uh, communities over BC. Our mm, stakeholders are, of course, uh, EHS, uh, the, uh, the ambulance service, mm, our, uh, my employer, and uh, the union is supporting it. All health authorities in the province are involved. And First Nation Health as well as the Union of BC m Municipalities is a strong supporter of uh, the community paramedicine. So what uh, does it look like? Uh, basically there are four components uh, uh, we address with that program and um, 
one thing what was leading to it, uh, short stuffing in the north or rural communities and hopefully with that position that might be addressed, that's the hope of the ambulance service. But we have now a position where we can put time and energy into community aspects like um, going first uh, to a community e events, providing services at Sea Fest or at a cannery run or whatever comes up in town. Uh, second of, of all, uh, we are involved in public education and health promotion. That means uh, we can go into schools, help with CPR, or we be going in other public places doing presentation on health relevant issues. Third of all, we do wellness checks, something really practical, mm, blood pressure, blood sugar testing in places where it makes sense. And one cornerstone is of this is home visits. And that is something fairly new, I must say, and it provides uh, assistance for people with chronic diseases uh, like COPD, emphysema, asthma, or um, other chronic diseases like diabetes. We do four risk assessments and help people on the last stretch of life with palliative care. So there is a program uh, for it, and um, we, the services are free to, uh, to the community or, or the people, but we will get um, referred by the health community, by doctors or by the hospital for those services. So the program is existing in existing now half a year here in Prince Rupert, and. Uh, we slowly, or I slowly understand a little bit more about community. And um, the way it works out is we're working um, with a lot of commu uh, different community organizations. Uh, it be the Salvation Army, it may be schools, it may be the hospice society. We work together with, have projects with CAPS and indigenous housing and Aboriginal service society. Uh, we meet on regular basis and service seniors or people in need. So th the way the programs with those organizations uh, will be in the future, we don't know. But um, one thing, uh, uh, driving thing is uh, find out service delivery gap, connect people who need it uh, back with the healthcare system, with their doctors, or some people don't have a physician or so. That uh, position allows me to put some time and effort in to make it different. Uh, I think that's in, it's in the nutshell, and um, my workload uh, is increasing so um, in end of summer, we will uh, get a second position here in Prince Rupert uh, to support me with my work. Also, I must say we are uh, not working with uh, volunteer organizations or community organizations. Uh, 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 we have strong ties uh, to Northern Health where we have projects with them and we work, uh, support local physicians and their patients as well. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm always uh, reachable at the ambulance station if I'm around. And if you have ideas how we can serve the community better, um, I'm open for it. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say, and thank you again for your donation that you made to the Crow's Nest Lodge yeah. um, to provide those materials for them. So we, re we really appreciate that. And I, my question actually would be, uh, how can we help you? Actually, is there anything you see that the city can do to help you with your efforts? Because it sounds like you guys are doing uh, some pretty great things for the town. Yes, uh, out of the cuff, uh, uh, I one uh, pr problem I encounter uh, <laughs> to share would be uh, safety for our seniors' homes. Um, I mean, we have 
I, I don't know whether it's the right moment to say that, but let's say the positive thing is if we look at uh, the old anchor in with their safety and security and on-site presence is a very safe building. Those safety is not enjoyed by Sunset Villa and Kane Housing okay. and, and very to the concerns of the citizens there. We f find the uh, solution like being creative, showing more presence there and get the people together in team building exercises or support them what comes out of from the seniors there. Uh, there are other people, one uh, I got approached is um, in, and I can, as an ambulance attendant, I can attest to it, uh, the safety of our crosswalking and incidents with pedestrian. And I mean, it's uh, that project is a little bit in the infancy, work with those people together. But today there are a lot of better technical solutions to warm the traffic uh, and not very cost expensive. Uh, I recently was in Whitehorse m uh, with my wife and uh, we, we could uh, copy those <laughs> things here. I don't know whether the Highway 16 is definitely the mandate of the city, but uh, the city can definitely push a, a little bit with the appropriate uh, agency for pedestrian safety. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Cunningham. Uh, great, great program. I've talked to you about it already a few times, yes. but uh, one, one thing that uh, I find is people that don't have, people that don't have doctors, how can they get involved in the program if they're not going to be referred by a professional? You know, because we have a large population in town here without doctors. Right. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they have wants and needs that go by the wayside simply because they're they're not in the mainstream medical care and that. Right. Um, so uh, with outreach in, in the community, we, we uh, I uh, detect, uh, now people come to me and we talk ab uh, about uh, their situation. I'm by any means not a medical doctor and give uh, big advice, but I know the basics and I advise the people um, so cross the barrier and uh, go go to the hospital, and if it have to, uh, I help them. But sometimes uh, medical treatment is delayed, and uh, bigger problems come later. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there is a linking together with Northern Health too, who, who uh, has similar efforts, and I know more the inner workings of Northern Health, so I can bring people. Uh, together of hmm? so um, sort of like a referral but ultimately they have to have uh, to go to the hospital or see some in, uh, street nurses or so the other thing is have you set up or tried to set up a program with the senior center for doing inspections for senior homes for falls and that because it's in in people that are living at home with home care and things like that it's it's a major problem, and when you get into their 70s and 80s and fall, it's usually brittle bones and that. So it's setting up a program with the senior center to actually go into some of the senior homes and inspect them for fall fall risks and things like that might and safety assessment might be a great idea if you yeah, set up a program. We do home safety assessment on re in individual basis on uh, referral. Um, also, uh, I link together with other group, we uh, do workshops uh, about fall prevention and we go straight into the uh, four senior homes uh, or senior residences we have uh, and promote those safety, discuss those things. They'll be reaching more people, but it's sort of a two-pronged approach and I'm only one person. and. Uh, you mentioned fall, it's uh, province-wide, it's a multi-million or billion dollar issue uh, with all the consequences. Um, if we, and we are a big city, uh, if we want to put more effort into those, uh, the city could lobby the ambulance service too. Uh, if this, um, what we're starting now to see here and we're seeing it's successful, then we maybe can ask for more resources, community paramedics to um, target more those things. So you say we're getting another, 
community paramedic? Yes, um, and um, that is uh, my uh, uh, license level is a primary care paramedic. That is basically uh, the foundation of uh, the ambulance service here in BC. This is an ACP paramedic with uh, advanced uh, treatment options and um, uh, I don't know exactly how it looks like, but we will be working uh, side to side and uh, maybe this, uh, I assume now this paramedic with th that kind of training will be used uh, for higher emergency too. In, in real life, it's so I'm not 911 driven. Mm? I dispatch myself or a uh, city or who else asks for my mm. services. But if it comes to emergency situations, it would be unethical uh, if I'm not responding with my single response unit uh, where I have defibrillator, everything. I can't only uh, transport patient. And uh, the ACP position coming in uh, will have their own response capability and uh, if I see a cardiac arrest situation in the rising in town, probably that uh, position will probably do uh, medical treatment uh, right on scene in the house, that, uh, but that is not there yet. Yeah, one, just one other quick thing and I'll let the other counselors at you. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like you to maybe set up a meeting with the senior center and go over some of your programs with them just so that they can do it. I can arrange that as I'm involved there. Oh, I'm uh, open for, for that yeah. uh, discussion and uh, throw the network out and bring people together. That's uh, the this, this secret. Hmm? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm quite impressed. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Mr. Olson, I just wanted to thank you for your service to our community. So you've been here for for 12 years and it, it's great to see the BC Ambulance going on a proactive front as well. So not just being the 911 go-to guys, uh, but that you're also on a proactive front as well. And I applaud you guys for that. And a second position sounds great to our community. So no, thank you very much. And thank you for coming out to speak today. Other comments from council? Well, thank you very much. Thanks. That was very uh, enlightening. Thank you. Okay, our last presenter tonight, we have uh, Sarah Dancer from Transition Prince Super Society uh, regarding proposed activities su for Sustainability Month. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Sarah Dancer and I'm here on behalf of Transition Prince Rupert. So our request tonight is to proclaim April Sustainability Month. Transition's mission is to engage with and inspire individuals and organizations in Prince Rupert to collectively create an adaptive and resilient community and Northwest region. <coughs> And so our request for Sustainability Month, why April? Well, to us, it just makes sense. We have a number of planned April initiatives. We have a Green Business Pledge Initiative, which is available on our website. There's a documentary night, Addicted to Plastic, planned for April 12th. And that's also being planned as a fundraiser for the Charles Hayes Student Council. There's the fourth annual Rupert Rubbish Roundup, which is a citywide cleanup on a neighborhood scale, which is planned for Sunday, April 14th. Of course, there is the global event of Earth Day on April 22nd. Recently, I saw that the kickoff for Positive Prince Rupert's cleanup initiatives is being held on Sunday, April, 20, April 21st. And then our last event, but not least, is a plant and flower swap, which is April 27th, planned with the Prince Rupert Garden Club. So the launch of our green business program starts April 1st. We're asking interested businesses and participants to meet five out of 10 criteria, which is listed. Uh, examples of this include replacing single-use plastics, having a recycling program, providing discounts for customers when they use 
their own containers, compost, etc. The full declaration is available on our website at transitionprincerupert.com. And to acknowledge these businesses and create that community around it, we have these stickers that you see an example of, which would adorn the windows to bring awareness to the businesses that are proactive and engage in green initiatives. Our documentary night, as discussed, is on the 12th, and it's going to be by donation at the Lester Center. So we're, we, we lightly recommend $5 for students, $10 for adults, but of course, be as generous as you can. <laughs> uh, we actually, this year, we have a, um, one of our directors is on the high school student council, so it's pretty great to be working with him. The Rupert Rubbish Roundup is in its fourth year, and this year we've been really, uh, it's been modified a little bit where there's going to be these 12 different spots for interested participants to gather in order to meet their neighbors and make their neighborhood meet. You can see on the west side there'll be Moresby Park, the Anchor Inn, McKay Street Park, and then Park Avenue 24-7. Central, there's the United Church, St. Paul's Lutheran Baptist Church, and the Prince Rupert Library participating. And on the east, we've got Henry B. Wise Market, the Overlook Community Garden, Maverick Foods, and the Tabernacle Church all participating. So <coughs> everyone is invited. E e even if you just get out and clean up your own yard, it's all part of the same beautiful process of just taking pride and living life. <laughs> Here's a photo from last year uh, where you can see one of one of your council members present with it and it's all smiles and there's a lot of camaraderie and, and good work that's been accomplished over the years with this project. And then lastly, we have our annual plant swap and markets. So this is a co coordinated effort with the, with the Prince Rupert Garden Club, and it's a fundraiser for both of our groups. We've got a lot of children's activities planned this year, and it's about having this local access to plants and really d discussing and encouraging lo local community agriculture in our community, which is part of our mission. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, I'm here. <laughs> well, thank you. It's awesome to see you guys bring transition to such a new level, so kudos to you guys for all the programs you have in place. Uh, definitely will be participating in the April events, so uh, happy to be doing that, and really happy you came on and presented that today. Questions from Council? Actually, yeah, uh, I'll be participating again this year. but. Uh, I'll throw a challenge out. I think everyone in council should participate in it. <laughs> and I think it's fabulous. I, it, it, it's part and parcel of the whole sort of ecological issue, which is really important to me. But it's another example of the ways in which it's really about the boots on the ground of regular people making all of these countless different ways of contributing that are going to be very powerful. So I think it's, it's, it's an excellent program. Thanks. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn and to uh, reconvene our regular council meeting. Moved by Councillor Nish, second by Councillor uh, Scott Morbin. All those in favor? Motion's carried. Recommendation that the agenda for the regular council meeting of March 25th, 2019 be adopted as presented with the additional uh, additions of petitions and delegations, agenda item 4A uh, being an opportunity for public to comment on the develop development variance permit application at 1089 Ambrose Avenue. Moved by
by Councillor Nish, second by Councillor Cunningham. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Item 3A, recommendation that the minutes of the Special Council meeting of March 11, 2019 be adopted. Moved by Councillor Eighty, seconded by Councillor Ranhawa. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Item 3B, recommendation that the minutes of the regular Council meeting of March 11, 2019 be adopted. Moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Skelton Morvan. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, so 4A, uh, we have an opportunity for the public to comment today about a development variance parent at 1089. Ambrose Avenue. Uh, so if there's anybody who wishes to speak specifically about that development variance, uh, you can come so uh, come forward here. Okay, seeing none, I'll move on to the next item of business. Uh, first up, we have a 6A report from our manager of community development regarding the municipal, municipal referral for cannabis retail store at 528 3rd Avenue West. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, as you're aware, uh, under Section 33 of the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act, the province must not issue a provincial license for the retail of sale of cannabis without receiving a positive recommendation from the local government in which the application proposes to locate. Uh, the city has re received a referral from the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch for a proposed cannabis retail store at 528 3rd Avenue West. Uh, you can see the location of the subject property uh, on the context map in included in attachment one of uh, this report. Uh, the application has been handled in accordance with policy uh, Council Policy 100-23. The applicant has submitted their business license application and complied with all business licensing requirements and paid the appropriate fees. Notices have been provided to residents and owners um, and have been delivered uh, by registered mail and published in the local newspaper in accordance with that policy. Uh, the city has received three responses uh, to those requests for comments and those are included in attachment two of the report. Um, at this time, the applicant has complied with all uh, requirements under uh, the business licensing uh, bylaw as well as the council policy. And uh, it is now uh, up to council uh, as to how they wish to provide a response to the liquor and cannabis regulation branch uh, for the local government referral. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from council? Council Eddie? Not a not a question, just a, a, a bit of a, a summary of a of a a journey I went on in the last couple of days because of a notice that was put on the city's website that had a, a rather short response time and it had been brought up um, in social media and so I, I'm you know I, I'm pleased to confirm that um, the, the duty to consult with the public and the pu public notice process is the proponents and not the cities in this case, and that all of those um, steps have been taken. So, Any further comments? So mo motion to accept. Okay, moved by Councillor uh, Nish, second by Councillor Cunningham. Further discussion? Uh, if Council wishes to provide a positive recommendation to uh, the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch, a, a move to provide such a positive recommendation would be in order. Yeah, he was saying the motion to accept it. So, motion to approve in a positive order. <laughs> Friendly amendment? Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have our planner uh, regarding the 1089 Ambrose Avenue Development Variance Permit. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, the uh, first report is on the Ambrose Avenue. This application dates to February 25th. It's for the property located at um, 10089 Ambrose Avenue. <coughs> this is a 
building dating back to 1940. It's well maintained. It has a larger than average front yard. The building is existing building is existing non-conforming and in order for the applicant to build a porch and a front entrance it requires um, variance to section 5.2.4 C at the west side for from 1.2 meters to 0 0.08 meters and on the east side from 1.2 meters to 0 0.3 meters. The proposed improvements will soften the uh, front elevation and add functionally to the entrance and aesthetically to the overall look and street appeal. Following the last regular council meeting, March 11th, uh, public notifications were issued and delivered within prescribed 50 meter radius of the subject property. Uh, city staff received a couple of over-the-phone and over-the-counter general inquiries and one specific one later retracted about possible conflict with the sanitary sewer service. In spite of the retraction, city staff conducted field survey and confirmed there is no conflict. With respect to the cost, there is no cost or budget implication to the city from granting or not granting the, uh, granting the variance. And the, in the conclusion, as of the date of this report, there were no objections that would prevent approval of this application. And that concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any comments from Council? Okay, recommendation of the Development Variance Permit Application DP-1902 for 1089 Ambrose Avenue proceeds to final consideration. Moved by Councilor Renhawa, second by Councilor Eighty. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, next up, uh, another application for development variance at 1034 1st Avenue West. <coughs> uh, on March 1st, we received an application for development variance permits for property located at 1034 1st Avenue West. A full application is attached, in, included in, in, in attachment 2. The attached application is for variance to the side yard setback, section 5.4.4C of the city zoning bylaw, from required 1.2 meters to 1.1 meter, as illustrated on the overhead projection. This is a new build, yet to be co completed, and the reason for this variance is a layout measurement error. Although the encroachment into the side yard setback is minimal, it requires to be recorded and it should not affect the neighborhood, neighboring property. Again, uh, there is no cost or budget implication to the city from granting or not, or not granting, the, granting the variance. However, the applicant does require approval to proceed to public notification. And that concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Questions from council? Why wasn't this caught previously? Uh, it was caught when the site survey was conducted. Okay. Other questions? Okay, recommendation of the development variance permit application DP 1903 for 1024 1st Avenue West proceeds to public notification. Moved by Councilor Ranhawa, seconded by Councilor 80. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Uh, you can just hang yeah. out there for a second. We got one little thing before we get back to you. Uh, so uh, we have a proclamation request here uh, to proclaim April 2019 as Sustainability Month in the City of Prince Rupert, as per the presentation. Moved by Councillor uh, Moreau, seconded by Councillor Eighty. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Okay, next we have a report from our city planner once again regarding the application to amend the quality of life official community plan and the zoning bylaw for a property located on Whaley Island Road. Uh, <coughs> the applicant, uh, Metlakatla Development Corporation, Metlakatla Nation, is in the process of securing a parcel of land from the province of British Columbia and plans to develop it for industrial purpose. 
The full application with a letter from the province of D.C. supporting this application and full description of site proposed, site and proposed amendments is included in attachment one. In brief, the subject property is vacant. It consists of, the entire property consists of 168 hectares, which is uh, hatched in yellow. And the portion subject to the amendments is 63 hectares, and it's outlined in heavy black. The, uh, pre the official community plan, and I'm using the overhead for the, uh, for the bylaw to illustrate that the um, um, official community plan has contemplated uh, in policies and, in fact, on this map as well, that there is potential for um, an opportunity for industrial development in the future. Uh, at that time, with uh, relatively um, little information, uh, the areas that are appearing as white were identified as suitable and therefore designated as designated as uh, industrial business industrial designation. Uh, Ridley Island Road is a controlled access highway and it uh, services um, the port facilities on Ridley Island. Um, <coughs> The uh, project, the proposal, proposed project has both opportunities and challenges. The opportunities include a rapidly growing transportation of goods which require land base for st storage and transfer, transferring of facility uh, of, and transferring facilities. And the challenge includes developing the site which is an epitome of North Coast property riddled with, with white with rocks, out, rock outcrops, organic deposits, and numerous drainages. And on this, on this uh, survey, uh, the yellow lines are actually surveyed major drainage creeks. Uh, the proposed amendment are both mapping exercise on a quality of life official community plan, the area outlined in heavy black, to be designated from open space and parks, to business industrial, and for the City of Prince Rupert zoning bylaw, the amendment is also a mapping exercise, and that is to amend this portion of the map from public facility zone to general industrial zone. Uh, with respect to the uh, full, 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 uh, full, um, full bylaws are included in attachment three. The applicant fees will be covering cost of public hearing notifications. The subject property is located at some distance from the Prince, Ur Prince Rupert urban area, and the information notification area would reach only the city of Prince Rupert and provincial crown lands. Newspaper notification only will suffice in advance of the public hearing. And that concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Questions from Council? Okay, well, we're looking forward to hearing from the public on this one. Uh, so a recommendation that Council gives first and second reading to the proposed ba amendment bylaws number 3436, 2019 and 3437, 2019, and that Council schedules a public hearing for April 29th, 2019 at 7 p.m. prior to the regular Council meeting. Moved by Councilor Moreau, second by Councilor Eighty. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. And one more. Uh, at 10... 51 Chamberlain Avenue. Um, <coughs> the city staff received the application, which is included in attachment one on February 1st, and it's for the property located at 1051 Chamberlain Avenue. This property was subject to amendment to the quality of life official community plan and city zoning bylaw in 2017 to permit then vacant motel conversion to senior housing. A condition of this amendment was, and this is my error, Mr. Mayor, I wrongfully identify housing agreement as covenant. Right. Um, amendment was the, uh, the covenant to, to rent to seniors over 55 years of age exclusively. 
Since then, the owner determined that their plan is no longer feasible and have placed the property on market for sale. Uh, prior to submitting this application, Mr. Warburton sought council's approval to discharge the covenant, which council agreed to subject to this amendment uh, completed. The Neptune Motor Inn was constructed in 1970s and through 80s and 90s provided accommodation to the construction and shutdown crews on Ridley Island and Watson Island and it also provided viable accommodation during the busy fishing seasons and increasing tourism visits. In the late 90s, the city and indeed the region underwent substantial changes resulting from a downturn and restructuring of both forestry and fishery-based fishery economy. Changes in economy also signal changes to both tourists and business and work travelers. Tourist travelers are increasingly seeking al alternative accommodation, and business and work travelers follow the cycles of new industrial development. Travel accommodation <coughs> is travel accommodation industry is in a flux, trying to accommodate the new, especially business work travelers. Mr. Warburton's proposal is clear and convincing on paper. To his credit, the paper exercise is supported by his exper experience of successfully operating a short-term accommodation First Avenue Suites. The proposed amendments, uh, the proposed bylaws are included, full bylaws are included in attachment three, and in brief, it will include a mapping exercise on quality of life official community plan and the area that's hatched would be redesignated from residential to business industrial. And for zoning, there are two, uh, there are two uh, items. One is the mapping exercise, which is to amend the zoning map and the area hatched from RM2, multiple family residential, to M1, light industrial. Zoning amendment also includes text change to the permitted uses which will reintroduce travel accommodation and restaurants. Uh, with respect to cost and budget, the applicant fees will cover the cost of processing and public hearing notifications. In conclusions, from a purely land use analysis, the subject site is located in a light industrial area zone. The city is lacking light industrial land to the point that the demand of light industrial land is spilling into the city commercial downtown zones. From that perspective, the best use for this property is light industrial. That said, we seem to be in a period of time where new construction costs are very high and the existing as assets are highly valued to the point that renovation and less purposing is better. In the long term, the property is best suited for light industrial use in the short term and to avoid better than vacant attribute, allowing it to reverse to, it, or to its original use will suffice. And that concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Comments from Council? Uh, that's a fairly large lot. Is there any <coughs> future plans where, or is there in down the road in the future, could more units be added to that? I would say that they are right around around the top of, of their of their of their site site usage, considering the number of parking places that are required and uh, for for the accommodation and for the restaurant. There is room, but I don't think there is much of room to increase the number of units. Other questions? Okay. Recommendation that council give first reading to the proposed amendment bylaw number 3438 2019 and number 3439 2019, and that council instructs the applicant to hold a community information meeting. Moved by Councilor Renhawa, second by Councilor Moreau. Further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions or inquiries from members of council? Uh, this is 
been a lot of touching on development issues um, tonight, and it, it seems to me that uh, not only is it a sign that some good things are happening, um, it's also um, a reason for us to attach some caution to thinking about losing some of those areas where people enjoy um, less formal um, land-based recreation. Um, as we're talking about in, in some cases um, changing parkland and so on. So, and I'm thinking not just of um, you know like the walking trails, which I think some really good work has happened. I'm also thinking in terms of some of the other ways that people like to get out and about. Um, I know in, in my own case with my son, he lo loves to ride his motorcycle. Um, and we run the risk of, kind of basically sort of freezing out that kind of activity if we're not aware of making sure that we're kind of t trying to take care of that quality of life recreational opportunity as well, whether it's, you know, it's not, not just my son's example, it's um, other ways that people like to get out and enjoy the environment without having to go down the road, down the highway, in my son's case, all the way to Terrace. So I would like to think that we can um, continue to encourage the development that's helping us turn that corner economically without losing sight of the kinds of things that people like to do in their, in their days off work. Because um, we've seen, you know, it, I've been here a long time, we've seen the loss of access to the, the beach along Ridley Island. Um, we've already, in, already in, in meetings more recently talked about waterfront access. Um, so it's a thing that happens, and if we're not careful, we're going to lose some other things as well, and I would not like to see that happen. So that's more a comment, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, people will share that concern. Thank you, Councilor Eddy. Other uh, reports from Council? Okay, and entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councilor Cunningham, second by Councilor Nish. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.